Okay, so I think we're up and going. Welcome everybody. Uh, we're working with Pathwork uh, Guide Lecture number 52. It was uh, offered June 5th, 1959. Here comes Dick. And uh, so I guess we could do uh, also a little opening go around uh, if anybody, this is a lecture that many of us are familiar with and also may have reread and seen something new in it. So uh, does anybody wanna just offer something before we go into the lecture? Uh, I've read this a few times because I have a I have a stumbling block here uh, with all images. I don't, I don't know if God image is particularly worse than the other images I have. Maybe it is. Um, I've recently had some kind of um, better understandings of my relationship with my father. Um, and I can really see how this tie my God image ties into, you know, this very fractured relationship that I have. As we go, I have lots of questions. So you don't mind, Great. I stop you and, okay. Absolutely. Please. Great, thank you. Anybody else wanna chime in here before we start? Okay, so uh, he says, greetings. I bring you blessings in the name of God. Blessed is this hour, my dearest friends. In the Bible, it is said that you should not create an image of God. Most people believe this statement means that you should not draw a picture or make a statue of God. But this is by no means the entire sense. If you think about this statement a little more deeply, you will come to the conclusion that this could not be all that is implied in this commandment. You must now perceive that this refers to the inner image. You are still so involved in your wrong conclusions and your irrational impressions that you are bound to have an inner image about God as well as on all other subjects that are most important in your life, right? So he's just saying, you know, that until we're more conscious, we don't really recognize, but, you know, almost everything in uh, childhood, we've created a, an image, which is basically an overgeneralization um, of reality, you know, so sort of all men are, all women are, work is, money is, right, you know, all of these big topics of, of life and, and others, you know, like the self-image, and, and this can get very subtle as well in ways that we, you know, are still recognizing, but, you know, to recognize that we do have these sort of generalizations and projections on these aspects of life that color and the relationship and our way of responding, you know, and, and being in that relationship. So uh, for us to make a real connection with God, it's important that we clarify, you know, what, what the real God is as opposed to the God image. And so um, he says, we are involved in our own wrong conclusions, your irrational impressions. And, and so these create this inner image about God and children experience, so it's all about authority, right? You know, it's like, because God, God is this, you know, what we're taught, and especially when we're young, you know, is God is the greatest authority, you know, it's the, the thing that usually, I mean, even some parents use God to scare their kids with, you know, and stuff like that, you know, to try to get compliance and that sort of thing. So, so children experience their first conflict with authority at an early age. And, and, you know, that's also because, you know, we have, well, he talks about it. Let me not read, let me read the lecture instead of speak to it. So he says, um, they learn that God is the highest authority Therefore, it is not surprising that children project their subjective experiences with authority on their imaginings about God. An image is formed, and whatever the child's and latter the adult's relationship to authority is, his or her attitude toward God 
will most probably be colored and influenced by it. Children experience all kinds of authority. When they are prohibited from doing what they enjoy most, they experience authority as hostile. When parental authority indulges a child, authority will be felt as benign. And when there is a predominance of one kind of authority in childhood, the reaction to that will become the unconscious attitude toward God. In many instances, however, children experience an admixture of both. And then the combination of these two kinds of authority form their image about God. To the degree a child experiences fear and frustration, to that same degree will fear and frustration unconsciously be felt toward God. God is then believed to be punishing and severe, often even unfair and unjust force that one has to contend with. I know, my friends, that you do not think so consciously but in the path work, you are asked to find the emotional reactions that do not correspond at all to your conscious concepts. The less the unconscious concept coincides with the conscious one, the greater is the shock when one realizes the discrepancy. Practically everything the child enjoys most is forbidden. Whatever gives most pleasure is prohibited, usually for the child's own welfare. This the child cannot understand. The parents may also prohibit pleasure out of their own ignorance and fear. And thus it is impressed on the child's mind that for everything most pleasurable in the world, one is subject to punishment from God, the highest and sternest authority. In addition, you're bound to encounter human injustice in the course of your life in childhood as well as in adulthood, if these injustices are perpetrated by people who stand for authority and are therefore unconsciously associated with God, your unconscious beliefs in God's severe injustice is strengthened. Such experiments also intensify your fear of God. All this forms an image which makes, if properly analyzed, a monster out of God. This God living in your unconscious mind is really more of a Satan. So let me pause there. Anybody want to speak to anything? Um, I expect you'll get in a little bit into the um, religious uh, aspect of God as well as the, you know the parental right right yeah we'll continue in this lecture yeah I mean okay. but it's interesting this is very deep and so it's like we don't even recognize I mean I was just I think like taking another dive into it a couple of years ago you know where something happened to me that felt a little unjust right you know and and it was very interesting to watch you know and it was with outer authority right you know how how all of this fear and, and this, you know, like, what did I do wrong, God, you know, kind of like unconscious stuff came up and, you know, a feeling of, well, what, what was this about? And, you know, I mean, I, I think in the long run, I finally ended up feeling like, well, it was just about this to bring up all of my, you know, unconscious God image stuff so I could you know, look at it one more time and <laughs> remember that it just wasn't true, right? You know, and, and, and it all worked out in a way, in a way more uh, grace filled than I would have imagined. So, you know, more or less reinforcing a benign, you know, reality of God rather than the fears that came up in the process. So um, most of the time, if we have some kind of shaking in life, you know, it's, it's when our God image will get activated in some way. Yeah, well, eventually I'm gonna, get into sin, punishment, <clears throat> um, retribution, all that's God stuff too. And that's being strict Catholic when I grew up, it's, uh, it's, it's embedded in there. Yeah, and, yes. I'm aware of it, but it's like, what? It's still embedded in there. Right, 
So, and, and it is, I mean, you know, it's on our culture at large to some degree, right? You know, that, that there is this sort of sin redemption theology. I mean, there are many great thinkers that are challenging this on all kinds of levels. Now, I like uh, Richard Rohr and I like Matthew Fox and, you know, Brian Swim also was, you know, raised Catholic, right? You know, and came to this whole other place. But, you know, more and more people are, are you know, seeing and, and, you know, you might like Richard Rohr because he kind of really blasts the church for, for this level of ignorance, right? And yeah, I read a little of his stuff. Yeah, he's right on. Yeah, and and it's important in a way to see the truth, right? You know, and and to see sort of the cultural conditioning around it because there is a lot that you know we we think is wrong with us, and it it really is in the culture. But it's the same thing. We still have to wake up, right? We have to do exactly what he says with the images and discover what the truth is and sort of re-educate the inner child, right, you know, in that. So, um, and, you know, some people don't use the word God anymore because it has, you know, all of these connotations, right, you know, that we have of, um, you know, the churchianity and the stuff that uh, we're, you know, not comfortable with. But I think in some ways, you know, I mean, whatever word we use is, is totally fine, you know, but I, I hate to, I'd like to rehabilitate the word God, you know, it's like it was this thing that we projected up into the sky, you know, the God up above, you know, that was going to be the, uh, you know, the Father God, that's kind of the Jewish and, and also Catholic, and then, you know, you have, you know, you have like the Divine Mother that's completely missing, except in, you know, some Catholicism with Mary, but you know, she's she's a kind of smaller image of the divine feminine that then is, you know, really accurate. So, you know, there's a lot of loss, right, in sort of the diminishment of the power of the, of the, the truth in religion, right? That religion is supposed to be there to help us bind back to these great, you know, realities. And, and this religion, uh, and in the West, largely religion became a source of control, right? You know, how do you control people? So it definitely has all kinds of authority in that church, you know, dictates. And, and again, the child internalizes them. And so, you know, that's the work because we have to free ourselves from all of that. I think someplace the guide says, you know, you have to examine every belief you've ever heard and decide whether you want to believe it or if that's true or not, you know, if that's what you want to believe. So, you know, we all have to explore in this way. And and then, you know, it's sometimes, you know, even though you know it, right, you know, it's it's a process of transforming the the fears of the child, the misconceptions and the images. So But yeah. I think it's a it's a beautiful work because if we can, you know, that as we go, that opens us more and more to the truth of the real God, right? You know, and to the the beauty of the the connection, which is our birthright, right? You know, the fact that we are missing that connection is is a great hole in us. And and so it's it's very important to try to heal the God image and connect with the real God. I was God traumatized too by the Catholic Church when I was young. Interesting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think Judy is. So we've got several, several of you. Yeah, and and I was never in the Catholic Church, but you know, and I was in a fairly liberal Protestant church, but I still picked it up. It's in the cultural airwaves. You know, it's like in some way or another, probably not quite as badly as the, the Catholic imprint, but. Um, so he says, you yourself have to find out in your work or yourself how much, you know, of everything, you know, holds true for, for you personally. Is your soul impregnated with particular or similar wrong concepts? You know, it's kind of like he gives us some various ideas and examples, but the, the job is these are the maps and we have to go into our own inner territory and see what it is that we hold. So if and when a growing human being becomes conscious of such an impression, he or she often does not understand that this concept of God is false and that God is not what is experienced in the psyche. Then the person turns away from God altogether 
wanting no part of the monster discovered hovering in his or her mind. This, by the way, is often the true reason for someone's atheism. I've got, hold on. Um, welcome, Tamara. She's getting, hello. Hi. Hi, welcome. So, you know, he's talking here about, you know, like you get to a certain level of consciousness and I can remember this in my own growth, you know, where I, I could no longer like align with, you know, like the churchianity's God, you know, especially if it was inconsistent or, you know, punishing, you know, I would read, you know, like, like some of the Old Testament expressions of God, you know, punishing people or whatever, you know, being angry at us, you know, and it just, it, it didn't ever fit particularly with my understanding of the message of Jesus, right? You know, and I was raised within a context of that, which was saying that this, this message was love, right? So maybe that helped, but there was something in me that, you know, realized, you know, there's something off in, <laughs> in this way that we see God, right? And so that also helped me go on my own inner journey and search, you know, what is God really, or, you know, is God really, you know, somebody that cares and what happens if we screw up and we do bad things, right? You know, I think my soul came in with a great koan of, you know, like, like what really is the price for messing up in another lifetime, right? <laughs> Seems like that's, I don't know what I did, but it always feels like oh, I must have done something because it, it feels like a deep question in my being, right? You know, that, that I keep working through in this lifetime. So, um, you know, these are deep questions that we need, you know, our relationship to God, right? And, and you know, that I like, I think I've mentioned before, Ken Wilber's, you know, first person, second person, and third person God. So there's a slightly different relationship with each of those. And they're slightly different, you know, uh, ways of experiencing and looking at this. But I think that we, we benefit from all three. And there's value in each of those. And so, um, you know, that first person relationship is the, the God within, right? The, what the guide calls the higher self or the inner spark or the Holy Spirit. Uh, well, you know, in a, in a way it's like the, the, Christ, the inner Christ, right? And then there's the I thou relationship, which I think we need as, as children of, of life right uh we all are young small and young and you know we've we're new on this planet even right and and as souls we're we're like children and so we need a, a father and a mother in the in the divine levels because you know it's it's appropriate right for the child to have the father and the mother and also our guides and all of the you know family and support that we have around us from from the astral, you know, and so we can be in relationship to these, you know, as a human being, right, needing help and, and seeking support for our loved ones and for ourselves. And then there's the third person God, you know, which is sort of the Holy Spirit and the, the God that is in the whole history of things, you know, the whole experience of everything that we're doing. and. And so God is in every moment of your life and, and in everything that is coming. And, you know, he brings things, even the crises, but it's not because he's trying to punish you or, you know, anything like that. So I say he, you know, personifying it a little bit, you know, but, but in a way there, it feels like there's an intelligence behind this, you know, this uh, movement of our histories and our experiences. Um, and sometimes it's, you know, reflecting our own inner, you know, dynamics and, and processes. But other times it's grace. Other times there's always this goodness of God coming to us, uh, helping in our lives. And, uh, you know, without that, we would be truly lost. So I think it's, it's good to have all three. And so you know, when, when we have this false image of God, you know, as some kind of a punishing, you know, moralizing, you know, thing. And when we get to a certain level of consciousness, you know, we, we have to break out of that. It's sort of like adolescence, right? You know, and so you have to rebel against, 
that. And I think he has another lecture where he talks about the stage of atheism as being, you know, an appropriate stage. Maybe it's in this one. I didn't get all the way through. And I also, my outlining didn't work. I've lost uh, my mouse and, and keyboard. So <laughs> we're limping through this a little bit. Um, but uh, both so is, go ahead. Mm -hmm. So so both um, Dick and Frank said that they were traumatized by the church. And, you know, definitely me as well. But it's this, it, it, for me at least, I don't know if um, Dick and Frank want to talk to this as well. For me, it's like it, because the church was the authority, right? Church was the authority. And the authority says God is this, right? Fits in this box. And then therefore, you know, you're shit or you're not good enough. You're whatever. It's difficult to disentangle that idea of authority and God. And, and I know the lecture is speaking to that, but it's really <laughs> muddled in my brain, in my brain, perhaps not my soul or, or maybe both. I'm not sure. Uh, you know, it's probably something that you really, you know, brought in and, and, you know, there's some, you know, there's divinity and distortion, you know, perhaps there, you know, so, you know, maybe we, you just need to explore a little more, like, what is this concept of God that you've, that's been imprinted inside of you, you know, and, and, you know, what, what is your sense of, you know, whether that makes sense or not, you know, in all of its particulars. Does that seem useful at all? It does, and perhaps even more so, what is my distortion around authority, uh -huh. right? Yeah, so that, that, that may be a big piece of it as well. Right, that, and that may, you know, show up in, in some way as you, as you also be, you would work with that, or, or yeah, you could. You could work with, you know, like again, directly through the childhood, experiences and see the overlay right you know of the of and the imprint of uh, you know how the father or you know can be also the mother right you know like any authority in school you know might have been the catholic church or school authorities right you know so it kind of they were all together probably to some degree so you got a m massive you know whole reality was that and nothing else right you know that's that's where it helps to go do some, you know, mind altering substances so that you can <laughs> break, break out of <laughs> the limited concepts of the mind that we get imprinted with sometimes. Um, I think you just sinned, darling, just so you know. Oh, okay. <laughs> Yes, I just, I just, uh, but out of temptation, <laughs> right? So yeah, but I mean, there is like, there's a kind of way that we get, you know, that we get the the world looks like this, and it was, you know, very much when Eva was channeling these lectures, she came in at the time where there was this kind of construct of the world that it was almost universal in our experience, right? Uh, and certainly in our families, you know, and it was on television and it was in the, you know, and, and there was just, you know, this kind of, it wasn't as diverse, it wasn't, you know, it was like this kind of one image of, you know, the family and, and churchianity and stuff. And, and so I think we all, you know, didn't have any other alternative and, and really until the 60s kind of came in. And then depending on, you know, where you were in that journey, whether you had a kind of initial awakening and breaking out of, you know, that box of reality. And so, but, you know, it's still, you know, it's still ongoing and we're still, I mean, I mean, look at, you know, sort of in the third person God, you know, with nature, what we did was we turned that into lumber and, and resources and board feet and, and robbed it of any sentience or any value that's outside of its commercial value, right? You know, and and that gave us the right to go and, and rape and destroy and do whatever the heck we wanted to it. And, you know, there's a way in which we're just now science, right? You know, that was kind of like the, you know, like the out picture, you know, when we, we went into a scientific, but now mm -hmm. science is uncovering 
all of this new information about how sentient and how intelligent, you know, all of these creatures are and how even the trees are talking, you know, so, so there's this new, you know, breakthrough again in, in our limited, you know, picture of what the world is, you know, which is, you know, also what God is, right? And that's, I think, what we're really trying to do now is realize that, yeah, you know, God is within, it's imminent, right? You know, it's not something far away up in the sky, you know, that we have to please. It's like all here in the world and around us. So he goes here a little bit into, you know, the different, you know, types of authority and what happens to the child um, and, uh, you know, the different splits that kind of get created. So let me just, I'll go ahead and read through this. It says, let us examine the case in which a child experiences benign authority to a greater extent than fear. Did I skip something? I guess not. Um, Fear and let us assume that overindulging and doting parents fulfill the child's every whim. They do not instill a sense of responsibility in the child, so he or she can get away with practically anything. The God image resulting from such a condition is, at first glance, closer to a truer concept of God, forgiving, good, loving, indulgent. This causes the personality to unconsciously think that one can get away with anything in the eyes of God, can cheat life and avoid self-responsibility. To begin with, such a child will know less fear, but since life cannot be cheated, one's own life plan cannot be cheated, this wrong attitude will produce conflicts and therefore fear will be generated by a chain reaction of wrong thinking, feeling, and action. An inner confusion will arise since life as it is in reality does not correspond to the unconscious image and concept of an indulgent God. And you know, this is what the child, you know, like the immature, you know, what the guide would call the lower self or immature child consciousness is, you know, we, we, we want God to be our slave, you know, at our beck and call, you know, and we want God to give us what we want when we want it. And we want God to, you know, make it all perfect for us and, and never have any pain or any, you know, discomfort. And, um, and so, you know, when, when there is that, you know, we, we this conflict comes up, you know, in, in terms of our image as well. And, uh, and sometimes we do. I mean, I know I have some of both. Uh, you know, my parents were good about, you know, letting children be heard rather than just seen, right? And so, you know, we were indulged somewhat in arguing back or, you know, sassing or, you know, fighting back in some way. And, and sometimes we got our way. <laughs> and, and I think that was really good and healthy in a lot of ways. But I also have to watch in myself a tendency, you know, to where, you know, I, I want to take that to the limit and, and get my way, right? You know, sometimes, you know, with in other situations and appropriately, right? You know, so I have a very strong self-will that will go to battle. And, and sometimes in adult relationships, you know, that that's not the best thing. So, The image does not only depend on the particular kind of predominant authority experienced in childhood, but also on the characteristics the entity has brought into this life. So, right, you know, there's always a blend, right? And, and so we have these experiences, but we already have preconceived lenses that we're looking through because basically what the guide is saying is we're incarnating already with these images. The images we're bringing in are unresolved you know, confusions and distortions from probably another life, you know, that, that you know, were, were already, you know, within us for this incarnation. And so even mild experiences, you know, he talks about this in terms of the soul dent will activate, you know, these um, beliefs and these uh, lenses that we look through. Other factors also play a role. For instance, when hostile authority in the person of a domineering parent 
is the predominant factor. The atmosphere in the child's home is filled with fear of this parent. The other parent may be doting and permissive. Although this influence is outwardly weaker, it may have a much stronger inner impression on the soul and the resulting image may reflect that. The same holds true in the opposite case. Although severity, injustice, and fear may have manifested as the weaker elements during childhood, the impression on the individual soul may be much stronger, thereby creating a more powerful image. Did that make sense? It's a little bit of a convoluted thing. But I think basically what, you know, what he's saying is that, um, you know, we, we, we think like maybe the fear, you know, the severity and injustice and the fear, you know, was the strongest influence. But sometimes, you know, it, it's, it's like on the weaker parent. So let's say, you know, we and maybe we rebel, you know, or we see we have our own judgment, you know, the stronger parent judges the weaker parent. And so we judge the weaker parent and and refuse to be weak, right? And, and or maybe, you know, the the stronger parent is so scary that we we get lost in our fear and we can't confront or we can't bring our positive aggression to bear on anything. Both alternatives are to be looked for. Even if one appears to be stronger to begin with, the pampering and indulgent God image is not simply added to the monster image, but is often a reaction to and a compensation for the false concept. And so there are, you know, people that do, they kind of, you know, have this, you know, want to believe in the fairy tale God, right? You know, but it's a kind of reaction to, into, to the monster God and, and somehow, you know, it's like you have to face the monster God, you know, and, and find some grounding in, in the, uh, you know, Santa Claus God in some way and, and find, you know, what, what, what's really the truth here? And so he says, the personality may grapple between these two concepts, con unconsciously trying to find out which is right, never winning the battle because both concepts are false. It is never just one kind of authority. It is very important, my friends, to find out what your God image is. This image is basic and determines all other attitudes, images, and patterns throughout life. And I think I, I feel like this is accurate, right? You know, and, and always behind all the other images, the God image lurks, right? You know, so when you're upset at whatever you are upset at, you know, consider you might be having a fight with God as well, you know, or, or if you're afraid of whatever you're afraid of, consider that at the bottom line, you might be afraid of God in some way. So do not be deceived by your conscious convictions Rather, try to examine and analyze your emotional reactions to authority, to your parents, to your fears and expectations. Out of these reactions, you will gradually discover what you feel about God rather than what you think. Your God image reflects the whole scale between the two opposite poles from hopelessness and despair, believing that the universe is unjust, to self-indulgence, rejection of self-responsibility, and the expectation that God will indulge and pamper you. Now the question arises, how to dissolve such an image? How do you dissolve any image? Somebody wanting to speak? First, you have to become fully conscious of the wrong concept. And that is not as easily or quickly accomplished as it might seem. Although you may be aware of the image to some degree, you by no means recognize all its implications, effects, and influences on your personality. Sorry, often, Darlene, can yeah. I interrupt? I'm sorry. Yes. Can we go back to the this paragraph just before this one? Okay, uh -huh. here we go. Your God image reflects the whole scale between the two opposite poles. So that sentence, to me sounds like your God image. So he could be speaking to everybody's God image. Right. Is every distortion possible? Is that what, <laughs> I, is that what I'm, 
Well, you know, in some ways we want to look inside of ourselves for both sides of these, right? You know, it's about this kind of tendency that we have to, to split. And, you know, like one side is the shadow and one side is what we're conscious of. And so you might be more conscious of, you know, one of the sides and he's just saying, don't forget, probably they're in relationship, both sides, you know, and so, and it also is probably true that we contain all of the distortions, you know, but, but it's kind of like in the search, you know, I think it helps to, you know, like discover what is, what is it that you really do feel about God and to see if you can find that whole scale within you and within your reaction, the way life unfolds. Right? Thank you. Makes sense. So um, he says, you may often be aware of an image, but you may not even be aware that it is false. And this, this is often true, you know, that we're identified, you know, with this concept as, as we understand it. And, and it is, you know, that, that we haven't had any uh, challenge or questioning that, you know, we might have a different way of looking at it. And he says, even in your intellectual perception, you are partly convinced that the image conclusion is correct. As long as this is so, you cannot free yourself from the enslaving chains of the false belief. So the second step is to set your intellectual ideas straight. It is most important to understand that the proper formation of an intellectual concept should never be superimposed on the still lingering emotional false concept. This would only cause suppression. On the other hand, you should not allow wrong conclusions and images rising to the surface due to the work that you have done so far make you believe that they are true. In a subtle way, this is sometimes the case. Realize the hitherto suppressed wrong concepts and ideas have to evolve clearly into consciousness. Nurse the awareness of them in your surface consciousness but realize that they are false. Formulate the right concept. And then these two should be compared. You need constantly check how much you still deviate emotionally from the right intellectual concept. Do this quietly without inner haste or anger at yourself that your emotions do not follow your thinking as quickly as you would like. Realize that your emotions need time to adjust while doing everything in your power to give them the opportunity to grow. This is best accomplished by constant observation and comparison of the right and the wrong concept. Observe also your resistance to change and growth. The lower self of the human personality is shrewd. Be wise to it. So, I don't know, like th that feels to me like sort of a very important, you know, description of the process there. And yet, you know, it still may be a little obscure in some way, right? You know, because, you know, it's like we have to bring to awareness, to consciousness, what the be what belief it is that is active in us in the moment, right? <clears throat> and then we have to kind of question, <clears throat> this is, I like Byron Katie's work. It's kind of along these lines, you know, she's, she says, you know, every, anything she believes, she always asks herself, you know, these four questions about, is it true? Is it absolutely true? Do I absolutely know this? You know, I can't remember. And what would, what would it mean if it weren't true, you know, kind of thing. So she does this whole inquiry with uh, exploring the truth of any belief that we have. And, and the guide is also, you know, like asking us to, you know, look in terms of spiritual law, you know, and, and this, you know, truth that he's bringing later on in this lecture, he speaks of the real God, right, you know, and so in many of these lectures, he's bringing spiritual truth, and if we can, if it resonates inside of us, right, you know, it's like it awakens the spiritual reality and, and understanding inside of us, right, and it is that then that we can use so well, you know, to work with uh, you know, these images. And so when we ask, we can tune in and, and, you know, 
look to the lectures, look to our own resonance with, you know, what we understand and hear is the truth that he's speaking in the lectures. And, uh, and over time, you know, as you integrate more and more, that becomes easier and easier, right? So that, you know, you are more aware when you're identified with a, an image and, and then it's more easily, you know, recognized where it's, what the truth is. And, and then a lot of the process of bringing the truth into the, to the place where the child still believes in the old thing is a lot of what we do in my groups and personal work, you know, which is this kind of healing of this inner child because it's sort of traumatized by all of this, right? And, and so we can't just sort of bring in the truth and say, look, you know, just <laughs> here, take this, you know, this is, we have to somehow help it. And, and it never had, you know, a friendly adult connection to try to explain the world and what things what was really going on right so sometimes I think of it that way like the guide is our our best friend in some sense and and bringing us these these truths and you know we didn't get our uh, you know the instruction manual when we came here right you know and we didn't know what we were supposed to do or how to work and so you know here he comes with this and uh you know, it, and it is a recollection, it is a remembering, right? So usually when we hear this truth, there's something in our side of us that recognizes it. And we may not fully understand it all at once, but that it keeps us, you know, delving into it. And, and as we do, we, we weave it together, we discover more and more how it all connects and how it is working in our lives. And then, and then it becomes our living matrix, right? In, in, as we do this work. Charlene? Uh-huh. Um, the, the word emotions has been used a couple of times in those paragraphs. And um, uh, emotions almost seem easy compared to what I, the word I would use with the Catholic upbringing I got is programming, um, <clears throat> our brainwashing even. Uh, and um, it's, it's some of the pieces of it are extremely hard to, um, I mean, I'm aware of it. I can, I have my own concept of God and um, especially for what, me. Yeah. Well, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, but I think this is where, yeah, the emotions fit right in because so think of one of those, you know, difficult concepts that you have of God that you, you kind of know now is not true, right? But now go feel the feeling with it, go into your body and, and notice the sensation, the way the body responds in that reality. It's a sphere of reality that a part of you, uh, you know, thinks is real, right? And, it, and, when it, and when it lives in that sphere, it, it lives a certain kind of consciousness and has a certain emotional reality as well, right? Can you sense that? Well, yeah, that, the, the word guilt comes up, as you okay. mentioned. So, so, so guilt and, and that guilt, it, you know, you have to examine that, right? You know, it's like, and, and so there's this whole journey of, you know, like feeling into the truth, you know, feeling into the, the, the fear of the guilt, the, the guilt itself, and, and what's the source of the guilt, what's the belief that you have, you know, about that, and, and you know, seeing if you can then bringing truth speak to the child, right? You can't just do it at the intellectual level. It is at the feeling level. So, so once you've done the intellectual work, you have to bring it into the emotional and, and bring that sort of, it's kind of like the good news, right? You know, the new revelation that the child doesn't know that, that you, you know, you know, at a deeper level and um, if you've worked it in some way, you know, the faith in that or the grounding in that is, is strong enough, right? More than anybody else, you're the only one that the child will listen to. And so maybe there's an issue where, you know, so you need still more of a, a process or, around, you know, the two beliefs, you know, and an argument about which is true. But once you find the true concept, you can imprint, but it is imprinting into the, the child emotional state. Okay, can I continue a little bit with that? Yes. I'll, I'll kind of out myself here with 
But my biggest issue, it seems like, from the Catholic Church is sexuality. And um, it's, it is, was so programmed that it was so mortal sin-ish over and over and over. That And sexuality is a natural you know, um, experience for human beings. And so I have bounced between earlier in my life being overly sexual uh, to the extreme. And that was a result of the guilt around sexuality. And now I'm at a place where I want healthy sexuality. I, I, don't, I don't actually have a concept of healthy sexuality because to, to, to tell my kid because it's, it gets so trapped in the past and all my past sexual experiences. It's like, I don't know any other. Okay, so maybe. that's good. So, that, so you know that you're sort of trapped in the duality and don't have a higher self reality to, to offer, right? So that's a part of what your search is for. Right. Let me offer something that maybe the guide, you know, would offer, you know, and I mean, you know, sexuality is a very primary thing. And, you know, when we get kind of screwed up with that, it's it, it's very deep and strong in the sort of animal nature of us. But, you know, the thing that that makes all of that different is to integrate the heart with it. Right. And and so we can feel even you know, when we integrate the heart with our sexuality, that it is no longer the dirty, sinful thing that, you know, we were taught. But the heart has to be involved, right? And, and if we don't know how to connect the heart and the genitals, right, then, you know, there's a, a kind of still split that's being worked through. Well, that's, a, yeah, I don't know if I'm going to get through it this lifetime, but uh, ironically, the lady I'm with is, uh, Joyce has got, she, She's got the same Catholic guilt in her, and my my trip was to go over sex, and hers was just to the complete opposite, and we're both reacting to the exact same confusion around sexuality and Catholic upbringing. So, so let go of all of that and just find the love, and then let the let the sexuality blossom from that. Well, that's that's actually what we're trying to do. So it's interesting, though. It's confusing. And, and even Masters and Johnson, you know, very back in the you know sixties, said the basically the same thing. Right, you know, when, when there's a lot of issues and you know stuff in the in the sexual relationship, you know, like let go of the pressure on the sexual relationship and just establish the connection, and let the rest flow from that. Okay. And there may be some other you know healing and and work with the child that you can still do. I'm not saying that you know, but but I think part of that is to find you know, find the, the grounding in the love, right? And then help share with the child to, to the extent that you can feel it inside of yourself that it feels different. You know, that it's not the same as what you were taught was sin, right? Which was, you know, there is a kind of sin in sexuality just for lust, right? And the Catholic Church put all of these, you know, okay, you have to be married, et cetera, et cetera. You know, like these were the outer forms to say, you know, you, you have to control that lust, right? But, but you know, in this day and age, you know, it's, it's like, I mean, there's all kinds of relationships, you know, and, and I would say, okay, so, you know, we can't any longer say we have to have marriage or and marriage never was a guarantee that there was love, right? So now we have to go to the deeper spiritual reality of what unites and what uh, brings that into the light. Thanks. So I mean, yeah. I think it's, you know, I hear, I hear your despair about it, you know, or your hopelessness, but I think it's definitely a workable issue. It is a deep one, you know, but for me, like all of these things, one, take time, two, when we finally, you know, like, get to the point of real frustration with it, it's probably right when we're close to, you know, but we have to get out of our box around it. We keep telling ourselves the same story about it, right? And then we keep being, you know, stuck. So, you know, this is, this is where I would say, you know, there's just more work there that's available, you know, and you can probably do some, you know, have this longing if you, if you, and, and to explore, you know, like, okay, so what does this guilt feel like? And, you know, what is that voice? Maybe there's actually a negative specialist that's attached to you, you know, that comes every time you think about sex and it's gonna, you know, like, 
you know, think, yeah, let's rebel and have more sex or, you know, and then let's feel guilty about it or whatever it does, right? You know, it's like um, th these things, they get, you know, they're like thought forms that come to connect because we have similar propensities and then they can literally, you know, come and uh, tempt us every time, you know, into the, into the darkness, into the pain body, into the, you know, the guilt and the, you know, frustration and the despair. So we have to become conscious that, you know, these uh, thoughts, even though we are deeply programmed with them, are temptations and not truths, right? And begin to at, respond to them as temptations rather than truths. Temptations into one. feeling bad, yeah. I'm not sure how to respond to temptation. That's a tricky one. Well, like, like if you think, if you think of the, the, the thought that makes you feel guilty about sexuality, right? If you think of it as a temptation, you know, you say, get the, behind me, Satan, right? You know, I'm not going to buy that. I don't believe that anymore, right? You know, it's like, you're just trying to make me feel bad and I got it. And I'm not going to let you make me feel bad anymore. I don't buy it anymore. And if you yeah. can't, if you're not there yet, you know, then there's, that's that step to go. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Well, that's just an incredibly big challenge because it's trying to make me feel good, but good in the wrong way, you know, so it's, it's, it's a very- Well, that's the rebellion though, against the authority, right? You know, so, so, you know, the oversex stuff, yeah, you know, like that, that, you know, you have to look at, so, you know, why am, why am I, you know, Where's that desire, that demand, that, you know, forcing current come from inside of me? And, you know, what does that want? And, you know, so, so again, it's kind of like, you know, that's just the lust, right? Without the love. And so without the heart connection. And so there's something in that, that yeah, you know, like, like wants to just be free to lust away, right? <laughs> And so, you know, just like welcome it. It's part of Rumi's guest house. Welcome it and learn more about it. Who is this guy in me that is so into lusting or what does it get? What's the pleasure? What's the negative pleasure? What's, you know, what's the defiance and the, you know, rebellion around the church issues, you know, all of that. Cause the guy will say, you know, you're, you're, you're gonna, all that's gonna be involved in this, right? And it is, you know, like with our, our sexual fantasies, it's one of the hardest things, right? You know, oftentimes the, the life force in our early sexual experiences gets affected. And it, you know, uh, we, the guide says we cannot moralize about it, right? So I don't know, Dick, if that's a part of it, you know, but, you know, that would be sort of the first step again is, is not, you know, not to moralize about how it is, you know, but seek to be curious and, you know, understanding somehow to, to know it more fully. And, uh, you know, when, when we get imprinted like that, it is like a deep imprint. And so, you know, it takes a deep re-imprinting of the truth that we have to keep, you know, working at. Um, yeah, well, I'm I'm working at it. <laughs> just it's just uh, sometimes it's a big one. It's a big one. It is a very some big things one. we bring in for lifetimes. The guide says, right? You know, it's not a guarantee that this lifetime we're going to get it. But it shouldn't be a helplessness or a hopelessness or a you know automatic negation of that possibility because that sounds like something else is going on, right? Yeah, no, I'm in the, I'm in it. It's just, it's just a challenge. Uh -huh. I think it's also important to remember that it's only a part of your personality that's distorted. It's not your whole self. Yeah. So you can't just say, you can't say, well, this part, this, this sexuality thing is really fucked up in me. So I'm completely fucked up. It's not true. You know? A, a good point, but I have, I've isolated it pretty much, but still it's a, but when it takes over, yeah, as 
I guess a lot of men know it's uh, it really is powerful. It's amazing. I, I would treat that as another being that possesses you. Interesting. Give it a name. Give it a name. Who is it? Don Juan, or you know, like give it give it an identity, right? That's not you, and and understand that sometimes it it, it you know gets bored or it gets hot or it gets something and it wants to take over and and it somehow does right you know it's like it knocks you unconscious and possesses you and and see if you can sort of like watch it from inside because you're not completely gone right but if you start getting moralistic with yourself you will you'll get in a battle and it'll it'll win so just kind of like watch it right and and um you know notice get very present and and ultimately to to work with those pain bodies like our presence has to get strong enough right to to kind of wake up and choose something inside of this deep possession right and so that's that's a big thing to do absolutely um and and the thing that happens that will help you the most is is practice of presence right you know and and that means just noticing, watching, feeling what's happening inside without judging, without reacting to you, you know, but learning. And, and as we build that muscle of just staying present instead of going up into our mind and wrestling with it, oh, and here's that problem again, and oh, am I good, am I bad, am I right, am I wrong? You know, all of that stuff takes us out of presence. All right, so. So let's go ahead and continue on. But that's, you know, it's a, it's a big one and that's good. Thank you for sharing that. And hopefully that, you know, it's right in this lecture as well, you know, because we have all these conditionings around it. And, and maybe there's some usefulness to, you know, ask yourself, what does God really believe? Or, you know, what does my God, you know, what does the true God, you know, call the higher self to be present to that? energy in you, you know, and, and ask it for help and healing. So, yeah, and again, you know, like, so, so there's this way that we're, we're working with how to dissolve the image, right? And then that's first becoming fully conscious of the wrong concept, right? And so, you know, that could, that could take a lot to bring that even that fully fleshed out right we get pieces but there's often additional things in it okay he says right there aware of the image to some degree but you don't always recognize all its implications and then sometimes we are aware of the image but we believe it's true so maybe there is a part of you that still really does believe you know that that you know whatever you believe you know about it so so you, you have to kind of ask the truth again, you know, from a larger, like it's where the mind has to transcend itself, right? So open to your higher self, open to your intuition, you know, open to your rational, you know, logic. Does that make sense, right? And, and ask, you know, do you, could you possibly even know that what you believe is true? Because usually the answer is no, we, we don't absolutely know anything, right? And, and that kind of cracks the cosmic egg a little bit, right? You know, we have these cosmic eggs that, that we're living in. And, and so we want to um, at least have a question, you know, have enough doubt, you know, that, that it's no longer a, a, an absolute conviction inside of us about the image. And then the next step is, is to try to get conscious, you know, what is the truth? And the guide is always telling us, ask for the truth, ask the truth. What is the truth about everything that we're feeling, noticing, reacting to? He says, it's important to understand that the proper formation of an intellectual concept shouldn't be superimposed. So we get the truth, right? And it's not like we have to deny the other part of it, you know, but, but we have to hold them side by side, you know, both hand in hand equal. So here's the truth and here's the, the, the concept, the image, the belief that I have that, you know, I'm wrong or God's, you know, a monster or whatever. And, and then, you know, by 
constantly comparing these two, right? And, you know, bringing them back and forth in, a, in dialogue sometimes too, you know, they, they will naturally come into uh, alignment. Otherwise we would be sort of causing suppression. And he says, do this quietly without inner haste or anger at yourself, that your emotions do not follow your thinking. Realize that your emotions need time to adjust while doing everything in your power to give them the opportunity to grow. And this is best accomplished by constant observation and the comparison of the right and the wrong concept. Observe your resistance to change and growth because that's got a whole truth in it, right? We have to, you know, if we say no, we don't want to like slam that no. That no is like an important voice. You know, the guide says it's our free will. It's it's, it's the most important voice that we have. And we have an absolute right to say no. If we don't have that right, then, you know, God is de the devil, right? So our, our God-given right to say no, but then we have to understand why not, right? What, what, what do you believe is going to happen, you know, if you have to change if you go into this movement of change and growth right that you're afraid of what what is your belief so i have to keep surfacing all of these understandings and beliefs that we're carrying so he says that the the resisting emotions do not care whether the proper concept is obvious or not in either case they will find ways and means of trying to avoid a change of inner attitude but as far as your intellectual understanding is concerned you must differentiate between two kinds of concepts, those that are obvious if you think about them and those requiring development from inside, inner enlightenment that has to be earned in order to formulate the proper concept even in your intellect. When you pray, observe how sincerely you desire the answer. You may dutifully pray for the recognition of your misconceptions, but inside there is a part of you, you know, and again, this is where we feel, right? You know, there's something that is not really aligned, is not joining in that prayer, right? And then at least you know that you yourself obstruct the light and freedom, not God. And then you can begin exploring, arguing with that part in yourself that persists in being childish and unreasonable. So that's the re-education part. As far as the proper concept of God is concerned, this is certainly one of the most difficult awarenesses to come by because it is the most precious. Whatever your image is in this respect, this is where you have to begin. If you are convinced of injustice so that you cannot see even factually that this conviction is wrong, the remedy is in finding in your own life how you've caused happenings that seem entirely unjust. So oftentimes, you know, we have this image that God is unjust, right? So he's risking, but that's not everybody's image, you know, or, or I mean, it's, everybody has some degree of that image, but we have different images. It's not the only image. So just take a minute and tune in, you know, what is the predominant God image? And again, remembering that we have like multiple ones probably, but you know, what is your sense? Do you have an understanding of what your predominant God image is? I, you know, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. I speak to that in, from my pathwork experience because I'm, I'm sort of like, in a way, have a reformed God image. Uh -huh. okay. <laughs> so know? going back in the past, what it used to be then? <laughs> yeah, in the past, well, of course, it was you know imprinted that God was doling out. Uh, punishment and favor, you know, and uh, that was the distortion for a long time. But then I got involved in path work, and I've done a lot of, um, you know, re-imaging, I guess, or whatever. Not that's probably not even a, an accurate. But I came upon a passage once that said, "God is truth." That's what the guide said. God is truth. 
And it's like, in, a, in an instant, when I read that, I was like, you know what? That's all he needs to be. That's all, it, that's all God needs to be, is the truth. Because until we know what the truth is about any given particular thing that we are confused or puzzled about, and we really don't know the God part of it, I guess. So, you know. Exactly. And, and seeking truth is seeking God. Yeah. That's right. And I, so I came, I sort of came to the conclusion, my pathwork con conclusion or process was that if the God is the truth, then the Holy Spirit is the deliverer of the truth. Because the Holy Spirit is who I can communicate with. So I just ask for the truth be delivered by the Holy Spirit. That's my new process uh -huh. in this new path work you know, <laughs> body that <Right>. I live in. <laughs> and, and it's like a, you know, a beautiful then, you know, sort of shift, it sounds like in, in life, you know, as a result of that, right? You know, seeing you know this potential of always knowing truth by asking holy spirit you know and at least seeking you know as best you know and trusting that when you need to know or somehow it comes right you know where truth is revealed and 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 compared to sort of living in that you know doling favors or punishments right you know yeah. it's like a very different reality so this, this is how, you know, huge the shift can be around our God, the images in, in many ways. And, and there really is, I think, a fundamental truth that our relationship with God is our most primary, consciously or unconsciously, and, and therefore kind of a source of our, our joy and, and, you know, wonderment or uh, our suffering and our, our pain. It also became apparent to me that all I ever really wanted to know was the truth right it's all we need you know i mean even as a kid all i ever really wanted to know was the truth uh just <laughs> it's just that simple you know so i'm aware I, we were only on page five of 15 so when we've got only about 20 minutes to go so let me see if we can get a little further in maybe we end up doing in two sections i don't know so but uh I thank you. I mean, I was a great example, Frank. I don't know if anybody else had. I really feel like that's important to, you know, have some examples so if we can, you know, open if anybody else had one that they want to share. So I'll go ahead and go on. So he's saying humans like to concentrate unduly on the apparent injustice that has happened to them. And there's a whole lecture on the pain of injustice and it's a big one, right, you know? But, but we do unduly focus on the apparent injustices and they focus on how wrong others are. And this should and can be recognized. But try to find your part. And I, this is important, he says, you know, it's not that we shouldn't recognize what others are, you know, doing and make that discernment, right, you know, and, and recognize and, and he even says in another place that more we know our own lower self and our own masks, the more we realize what other people are up to, right? There's, it adds to our discernment. And we should know, you know, um, and yet, you know, it's not about judgment or blame or, you know, anything like that. And, and always, if it's happening in our experience, right, there's something that is within us that is, you know, it's, it's, there's a gift in that, you know, somehow God is reflecting something, we're being, you know, awakened to something else, shown, you know, trap, you know, like maybe we're even falling into a pain body again, but that in and of itself is how we're, we're learning and growing to um, evolve beyond that. And so he says, if you make half the effort we usually make when finding others' faults, to recognize your own, you will see the connection of your own law of cause and effect this alone will set you free. It's part of that truth, right? And will show you that there is no injustice. You will see that it is not God, nor the fates, nor an unjust world order where you have to suffer the consequence of other people's shortcomings. But your ignorance, your fear, your pride, your egotism, 
that directly or indirectly cause that which seemed so far to come your way without your attracting it, right? You know, I mean, oftentimes, you know, why is this here, you know? It just, you know, it doesn't seem like we're consciously aware of it. And I don't know that I always can find how I exactly attracted it. But usually if I ask the question, what's it bringing up in me? I can get to the point of seeing how come it's here, <laughs> right? You know, what the point of having it in my life is, if nothing else, right? Because there's something that is getting triggered that I need to see. It's bringing something into the light for me, right? And so if nothing else, I can always find where it's that kind of a gift and that some part of my higher self must have <laughs> invited that, you know, or, or created that. And maybe also my lower self had something to do with it, right? And then you can go in and find more of that as, as you go. So he says, find that hidden link and you will come to see truth. You will realize that you are not ever a prey to circumstance, other people's imperfections, but really the master of your fate. You will deeply understand not only in theory, but in practice that everything happening to you is a direct or indirect result of your attitudes, deeds, thoughts, and emotions. As far as the latter are concerned, they are most powerful of all. And this is constantly overlooked even by my friends who have learned and at times experienced this truth. Your own unconscious affects the unconscious of other persons. And this I've, you know, see a lot, you know, and I always, you know, if I'm in a negative space or if I feel some defense or some, you know, charge in or forcing current in me and somebody reacts, I never feel, you know, like, like, you know, they did the wrong thing, right? I always recognize, okay, so that was a tit for tat, you know, I was coming at them you know, in some way. And so they reacted, right? So I'm going to wipe that off as <laughs> equal and try to de-escalate, right? Rather than escalate. Um, so he says, the truth is perhaps most relevant to the discovery of how you call forth all happenings in your life, good or bad, favorable or unfavorable. Once you experience this, you can dissolve your God image, whether you fear God because you believe in injustice or afraid of being the prey of circumstances over which you have no control. Oftentimes our God images, you know, we should, we should surrender to God, right? And, and so maybe we even do from a mask level, but deep down inside, right? You know, like we really don't, we're afraid God, God might ask us to, you know, go hang on a cross or do something, you know, really hard that we don't want to do. And so there's a, a secret rebellion that we feel inside, right? Even though maybe we're, we're trying to find a way to say yes. And, and there's this fear that God wants us to do something that is not really what we want. And so that's another way that we get all tangled up in God images. And he says, um, we're never this prey of circumstances, you know, whether you reject self-responsibility and expect an indulgent pampering God to fix your life, make decisions for you, take self-inflicted hardships from you. The realization of how you cause the effects of your life will dissolve either God image. This is one of the main breaking points. So does that make sense? You know, if we can uh, see how sort of this third person God of the events of time and effect in, in, in our lives, you know, is it's like from a more primitive consciousness, we, we just assume, you know, God is inflicting, you know, the the rain washes out the crops and we surrender to God. And the guide even says in one of the lectures that in some ways that's an easier surrender than when we get a little more conscious, right? And have to deal with self-responsibility, you know, to just accept that it's all God given. But this is a level now that we're having to open into the self-responsibility and, and see that, you know, God isn't doing this. <laughs> you know, God wants always the good for us and always, you know, the best for us and has compassion and, and is chasing after us and trying to help us from our own self-inflicted suffering. And it's the self-inflicted suffering that we have to recognize because not even God can prevent that, right? You know, it's like the only person that can stop that is our own self and our own free will and our own choices. 
So one of your handicaps is your guilt feelings, or rather your wrong attitude toward guilt. To understand that, it might be advisable to reread my lecture on the subject of justified and unjustified guilt feelings and the proper attitude toward shortcomings. If your faults depress you so deeply that you are afraid to face them, then this wrong attitude has to be worked on first because it hinders you in coming out of your own vicious circle. The guiltier you feel about possible wrongs you may have to face, the more do you escape reality and thereby inflict harm on your soul. The proper and constructive attitude toward your own shortcomings is the key to the dissolution of this and all other vicious circles you might be caught in. Understand that none of your faults are committed out of malice or because you wish evil on other people. All faults, every kind of selfishness, is nothing but a misunderstanding and a wrong conclusion in itself. Your fear often makes you so paralyzed that your faculties cannot function properly. As a result, errors in judgment, action, and reaction on your part bring effects into your life which you no longer connect with the origin of your fear. As long as you shy away from facing your erroneous reactions because of a faulty attitude toward your shortcomings, you cannot find the breaking point, which alone will bring you the recognition that you are not a victim, that you have power over your life, that you are free, and that the laws of God are infinitely good, wise, loving, and safe. God's laws do not make a puppet out of you. They make you wholly free and independent. In order to help you find the proper concept of God, I will try to speak about him. But remember that all words can at best be only a small point to start with in cultivating your own inner recognition, right? You know, it's like, like these ideas can help us you know, guide us to seek and to find the, the truth within because it is there, but without our own inner recognition, it's just another belief thing, right? So he says, words are always insufficient. How much more so when it concerns God, who is unexplainable, who is all things, who cannot be limited into words. I was reading in, um, or there was a YouTube video I put out with Mike, or Richard Rohr where he talks about, you know, the unspoken name of God in the Bible, right? In the Hebrew Bible, you know, they, they don't speak the name of God because how can you, you know, speak that? You know, it's beyond all speaking. And 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 so they they designate that being by these consonants that, you know, are the soft consonants of the breath. So he says you know, like Yahweh is an, is an in-breath and an out-breath, right? And God is as close to us as our breath. So, you know, you might pretend or play with that, not pretend, but just play with this. But again, it goes back to this idea that we, you know, God is unexplainable, unnameable. So how can your perception and capacity to understand suffice to sense the greatness of the creator. Every smallest inner deviation and obstruction is a hindrance to understanding. We have to be concerned with the elimination of these hindrances step by step, stone by stone, for only then will you glimpse the light and sense the infinite bliss. One hindrance is that despite the teachings you have received from various sources, you, will, you still unconsciously think about God as a person who acts, chooses, decides, disposes arbitrarily and at will. On top of this, you superimpose the idea that this must be just, but even though you include the word justice, this idea is false. For God is, his laws are made once and for all and work automatically. Emotionally, you are somehow bound 
to a wrong concept and it stands in your way. As long as it is present, the real and true concept cannot fulfill your being. So in a way, this is, I think, more like third person God um, and first person God, right? So God is among so many other things, life and life force. Think of this life force as you think of an electric current endowed with supreme intelligence. You know, think of the, you know, like when I say call light, you know, that's kind of what I mean, right? This electric current is there in you, around you, outside of yourself. It is up to you how you use it. And we can call it and we can direct it with our awareness, with our intention. So when we're feeling a pain in our body, you know, we can go into it and breathe and call light there, right? And with the breath, you know, we, we breathe it and there's a sense that light comes and sometimes releases, sometimes you know, deepens and you travel and it's like there's a healing that's going on. And you can use electricity for constructive purposes, even for healing, or you can use it to kill. That does not make the electric current good or bad. You make it good or bad. This power current is one important aspect of God where it touches you most. This may lead you to think that God is entirely impersonal and therefore to be feared even more. It may contradict the idea of his infinite love. So neither is true. God being all is personal as well if he chooses to be. But his personal aspect has no bearing on the question we are now discussing and on one of the most important aspects of your personal life. His love is not only personal in God manifest, but also in his laws and in the being of the laws the apparently impersonal love of the laws that are. Understand what is implied in the words that are. Show clearly in the fact that they are made in such a way as to lead you ultimately into light and bliss, no matter how much you deviate from them. And the more you deviate from them, the more you approach them through the misery the deviation inflicts. This misery will cause you to turn toward at one point, turn around at one point or another, some sooner, some later, but all must finally come to the point where they realize that they themselves determine their misery or bliss. This is the love in the law, as is the fact that deviation from it is the very medicine to cure the pain caused by the deviation and therefore brings you closer to the aim. The love of the law and therefore of God is also contained in the fact that God lets you deviate if you wish. That you are made in his likeness, meaning that you are completely free to choose as you wish. You are not forced to live in bliss and light. You can if you wish. All this means the love of God. It is not easy to understand. But those of you who have difficulty in understanding will one day see the truth of these words. When you have difficulty in understanding the justice of the universe and the self-responsibility in your own life, do not think of God as he, although of course God can manifest as a person too, since he can do anything and is ev everything. Rather think of God as the great creative power at your disposal. Therefore, it is not God who is unjust, as your subconscious may believe, but it is your wrong use of the power current at your disposal. If you start from this premise and meditate on it, and if from now on you seek to find where and how you have ignorantly abused the power current in you, God will answer you. This I can promise. If you sincerely search for the answer, and if you have the courage to face it without the wrong kind of guilt feelings, and you should all be able to do that by now, you will come to understand cause and effect in your life. You will come to understand what led you to believe, perhaps unconsciously, but all the more powerfully, that God's world is cruel and unjust, a world in which you have no chance, in which you have to be afraid and hopeless, a universe where God's grace comes to a few chosen ones, but you were excluded. 
Only understand the law of cause and effect can free you of this fallacious view of God that distorts your soul and your life. I know you do not think you do not think all that, but many of you feel it deeply hidden in your subconscious. You try to find that try to find that part in you where you do not where you do feel that way, regardless of your simultaneous sincere love for God. Find out whether you fear God more than you love him. If you do, you can be sure this image of God exists in you and you are living in distortion and illusion since all images are just that. Enumerate the injustices of your life, but do not examine the lives of others or general conditions for there you cannot find the answer. Try to find where you have abused the power current and connect these instances with the injustices you complain about. If you cannot do so right away, I will help you and further work will show the connections quite clearly, provided you truly desire the answers. You have no idea what this discovery will mean to you. The greater the resistance to it at first, the greater the victory. You have no inkling how free it will make you feel, how safe and secure. You will fully understand the marvel of the creation of these laws that let you, with the power current of life, do as you please in creating your own life. This will give you confidence and the deep absolute knowledge that you have nothing to fear. So um, I still have quite a ways to go. Uh, so let's maybe consider uh, doing this in a two-parter. Oh, the next is Q and A's. So, okay, let me go ahead and finish the lecture and maybe read the uh, blessing or the uh, ending. And then uh, I'll take a look at these Q and A's and see if we want to go over them. So he says, there is a type of personality so negative in this respect, though perhaps only subconsciously, that he or she is deeply convinced of the futility of one's own life and the available life force can work only in a negative way. This may sound like a paradox, my friend, but it is not. Life force is energy. And in a personality problem of this type, the energy is used only negatively. This means, for instance, that the person becomes most alive in negative situations, in situations of fight, unrest, quarrel, and disharmony of any kind. Then something vibrates inwardly. Yet when everything goes smoothly, although a part of the personality may enjoy it, usually the conscious side, another part feels deflated and lifeless. This indicates that the distortion about God has progressed to a considerable degree. To a small degree, most people have this reaction, at least occasionally. You know, we get bored with life, right? We want some juice. The juice is in the negative, right? You know, um, so examine whether you feel more alive in a negative situation and more dead in a quiet one. Your reactions will have a connection with your God image. So I'm just going to scroll through the Q&As now and see if he has a closing here. Yeah. So um, he says, my dearest friends, may the words I give you tonight bring light into your soul into your life. Let them fill your heart. Let them be an instrument to liberate you from illusions, my dearest friends. I bless you, each one of you individually and as a whole. God's world is a wonderful world. There's only reason to rejoice on whatever plane you live, whatever illusion or hardship you temporarily endure. Let them be a medicine for you and grow strong and happy with whatever comes your way. Be blessed, be in peace, be in God. Okay. Any last statements or questions or comments? That was great. Thank you very much. Um, I like this idea of the power current and what I do with it and how I give it away. It's a lot to think about. Yeah. yeah.
there's a, a tremendous amount in this lecture, as all of them, and they all weave together. So, but yeah, good. Glad that it helped. Thank you. Darlene, do you Great, think? Thanks so much, Darlene. You're welcome, Jacob. Go ahead. Oh, good night. Yeah. Do you think that the, uh, when he, when the guy talks about God's laws in this lecture, that they are actually the same spiritual laws that are outlined by the, yeah. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and we went over those to some degree, right? Yeah, we, and, and you can see, I mean, it, it might be useful to go back and look at those since you read this lecture and, and see if you can see how God's love is embedded in those, right? Mm -hmm. um, and how through those, you know, was, no matter how lost we are in consciousness, you know, somehow we can find our way home. So, okay. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, everybody. Good night. Good night. Night, Tamara. Good to see you. It's nice to see you too. Good night, beautiful woman. If I, I can't even figure out how to hang up myself. So that Lord <laughs> <laughs>